Today, we are delighted to have Vera Ayia, one of our newest Quran literacy authors, present today on her newest book, Rebellious Read Alouds. And for a nice surprise to start your week, Corwin will be giving away two books at the end of the webinar to two random winners. So make sure you stick around and see if you are one of those lucky winners. And now I have the pleasure of, present, of introducing today's presenter. Next slide. Originally a pre-med student, Vera Aya realized her calling as an educator at Austin College. Um, a calling shared by many of her family, including her beloved Papa. She has taught kindergarten and first grade for 16 years in Texas, Massachusetts, and Brooklyn. Vera's love for children's books has led her to becoming an Instagram book influencer, where she showcases her love of children's literature and highlights books and authors that discuss the necessity and power of diversity and voice in children's books. Vera uses her extensive online presence to advocate for teachers to be purposeful and always inclusive with their choice of text in their classroom. Vera also just wrote her first children's book, You Have a Voice, which published in January, 2022. And now I'll turn it over to Vera so we can get started. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, thank you everyone for being here. I'm so excited to chat with y'all today. Um, I am going to do my very best to keep moving, but I definitely want to hear from you. I'm gonna open the chat on uh, my end. And as I'm reading along, Margaret might um, pop up with some uh, wonderful questions for me to ask. I'm gonna do my very, very best to um, check in with y'all because I would love for this to be a conversation and not me just talking at you the whole time, but um, I'm just so excited. This is uh, the Rebellious Read Aloud is kind of like a love story, love story, a love letter to kids everywhere, um, just about some really great books and ways to get started with these conversations that are so vital. Um, I love being from Texas, but as you may know right now, Texas is doing a lot of some yucky stuff with book banning. And so what I'm hoping is that books um, like Rebellious Read Aloud inspire educators and parents and caregivers to start these really important conversations, get these really great books in the hands of kids and just start showing them the beauty that's in the world around us. So uh, let's get started. Thank you all so much for being here. Like Margaret said, um, this is just a little bit about me. I'm originally from El Paso, Texas. Uh, I'm a kindergarten teacher. This is my 16th year of teaching, which is bananas. Um, I love children's books. I just love them so much. And I'm trying to call them picture books instead of children's books because I feel like they're for everyone, not just children. Um, this is me at the book launch of You Have a Voice, which was my very first picture book. So this is me as a reader, uh, very dramatic, even at, I don't know, maybe three or four, clearly. Uh, my mother was an English teacher, so we had books everywhere. Um, and I was taught, you know, Shakespeare at a very young age. That's how much books and reading were a part of our life. Um, so I always had a book in my hand. When my mom would go to the salon, I was sitting in the corner reading. Um, and I read everything and I was taught during the era of reading quickly meant you were a good reader. Um, so I don't know if many of you remember that time in history, but there was a time where we were taught to read fast and that reading quickly meant you were just a great reader. Um, but I actually just didn't remember anything I was reading because I was just like pushing through. Um, I see people in the comments were like, me too, for sure. It was um, great. I could finish a book in hours, but I can barely remember what I read. Um, but one thing I do know is that I really saw myself presented in the books that I was reading or were presented to me. And in Rebellious Read Alouds, I talk a lot about my love for the Goosebumps series um, and R.L. Stein's, you know, uh, prom 
prom street or yeah all of the fear street all of those books were great i love them and a part of why i love them so much was because it didn't matter race wasn't a part of the conversation it was just about um how the character was going to run away from the ventriloquist dummy so those books i devoured because there was a very little um necessity to see myself in those books um, but i do remember not seeing myself evident in a lot of the books uh, presented to me definitely presented to me in the classroom or in, even in my visits to the library um so what is a rebellious read aloud and if i'm going to be perfectly honest i've gotten a lot of feedback saying like I'm not rebellious because these books are a part of our curriculum in our library um, and, and feeling as if the word rebellious um, kind of others the uh, groups represented in this book and I definitely want to say that that's not uh, definitely not my intention or my intention but it's definitely um, a privilege to be at a campus where your uh, administration and the families at your school um, support you in your quest to be inclusive. That is amazing. Um, but we should also rec recognize that that's not the case for everyone. And there has to be a little rebellion in some teachers in some of the places they are, um, that they are fighting against even their own bias. And they're rebelling against the things that they thought were true and it might not be you know a rebellion in that you're doing something um you know spontaneously wild or adventurous or very different than um the norm but even if you were somebody who used to think one way and you have the chance to engage in a book and conversations with not only children but other uh, peers that allows you to see something beyond what you thought was right that's that sparks a rebellion um and so this is what the rebellious read aloud is no matter your your spectrum of rebelliousness it is that we are rebelling against the norm the norm that says early elementary students are too young to have important conversations the norm of a white Eurocentric curriculum that only tells one side of a very important story, the norm of a nuclear family, the norm of colorblindness, the norm that says disability means helplessness, the norm that says you can't do that or say that in public schools. And we're rebelling against all of these ways in which we've been told to be quiet, to ignore or to dismiss. Even we're rebelling against the shush the, oh, no, 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 shush, shush, shush. Um, the best intentions, right? Let's push those out of the way. Let's travel down a path, a path that shakes up the norm. It is loud, it is thoughtful, it is inclusive, it is rebellious. And it can start as something as simple as a children's book. And I see so many of you in the comments saying um, that kids are ready for these conversations. and. 100% I agree with you. Um, and more importantly, we are ready as adults to have these conversations that we didn't have um, when we were younger and growing up in school that we wish we had had when we sat in our college courses and we were learning about the true history, right? Then we're like, I wish, I wish somebody had told me that earlier. No, we get to do that. We get to start these conversations with kids as soon as possible. So a rebellious read aloud features characters that are accurate representations of a group, both in the illustrations as well as in the representation of the, the words and the stereotypes being um, portrayed, the history that's being portrayed. These are going to be as accurate as we can. And when I was trying to culminate um, a list of really great books, especially when I was looking at, you know, the section of our features are important. I really had to do a lot of work about my own bias and my own ignorance around things that I thought were right. Um, and I learned so, so much from educators around the world about illustrations of the Asian eye or the way that we illustrate um, children's bodies. So how many books did I have that had different body shapes of young children? Um, and in the ways that 
brown skin was represented. Were there dark skinned um, brown people represented in some of the books? So there's a, a vast, vast majority of ways we can think about representation. And when I pick these books, I tried very, very hard to think about what I didn't know in my own ignorance and try to learn to be as inclusive as possible. I'm sure I've made a mistake or two in there. I'm sure that there are things that, you know, come 10 years later, I'll look back and be like, I really should not have done that. Um, even while writing the book, you know, there was all these conversations around the idea of own voices and, and, and the importance of uh, recognizing how that conversation has changed in the last five years. So we're always learning and growing, um, but these books specifically really try to have as much accuracy um, as possible. These books are also a catalyst for conversation and not the end. So you'll find yourself reading a book with a kid or a group of students, and you might not even get to the ending because your time ran out and you were engaged in such great conversation. And that's the importance. That's what we want to spark in kids. We want them to go home to their families um, and be like, did you know? Did you know? Hey, did you did you see this? We read this book and we learned that. Um, so that they can start to, to drive themselves to acquire more knowledge about the world. Um, and lastly, it does not make you an anti-racist. I really, I really wish it could be that easy. Um, the world would be a much different place if it was, but no, it doesn't. It at least gets you started on a path of understanding, maybe on a path of checking your own bias. Um, but having a diverse and inclusive library does not make you an anti-racist. That work is continual. It's in all parts and all facets of what you do. Um, but I will say a picture book is a great start to learn more. So what is diversity? Um, it's really quick. Michelle Cunningham, your question, I will get to it towards the end. I love the question about family and caregiver kickback. And we are definitely gonna dig into that because that is a hot topic every time I talk to educators about these books. Um, so what is diversity? This is my favorite, favorite, favorite definition of diversity. I think I've been using it for the last, definitely the last four years. Um, it came from the University of Oregon and I feel like it's just beautiful, it's accurate, it's succinct. Um, you can read it here, I'll read it out loud. The concept of diversity encompasses acceptance and respect. It means understanding that each individual is unique and recognizing our individual differences. These can be along the dimensions of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, social economic status, age, physical abilities, religious beliefs, political beliefs, or other ideologies. It is about understanding each other and moving beyond simple tolerance to embracing and celebrating the rich dimensions of diversity contained within each individual. And I just love it because I think so often diversity has been coded to mean non-white. Um, and it's so much more than that. And it's so much more inclusive than just race. Um, you know, you can have a group of predominantly white boys and that whole group is diverse. You know, they don't all have the same family structure. They definitely don't all think the same. Um, and so there's just all these elements we really should think of when we're thinking of diversity. Um, and I know that it's a coded, it's definitely a buzzword, but holding on to that, there are so many ways in which we are diverse. Um, and because of that, we think about who we are and how that who we are is embedded in what we do as educators. And we have our own bias, we have our own experiences, which are weaved into everything we do, all of our practices, the way we interact with our students, um, and how those core values come into our classroom affects the way our children and our students learn and engage in learning and engage in the books that they choose in the library. How often do we talk about or share with students books that feature uh, people with different religious beliefs or books that celebrate different holidays? All of these wonderful things that might be uh, important to us might not be as reflected in the lives of our students. And so how can we quell 
in not a way that stifles, but allows for all voices to be explored and celebrated in our classrooms. So um, why diverse books? And I saw earlier somebody mentioned mirrors, windows, and sighting glass doors, and that will forever be the most um, succinct way, I think, to celebrate diverse books. Um, that phrase was coined by Rudine Sims Bishop, who is also known as the mother of multicultural literacy. She was, she spent much of her time in the early 90s, sorry, I need some water, examining children's literature. And she expressed the need for children to both see their own lives reflected in the stories they read. Um, and so that's where we get the idea of mirrors, mirror books, we get to see our own lives in the stories we're reading, window books give us a view into a new world um, and sliding glass doors allow us to step into a world that's different than our own um, and step back into our own world and so i, I include redeem some bishop's work in um, rebellious read aloud not as just a reminder of where mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors came from, but also as um, a marker of the important and significant and life, life affirming for me um, work of Black women. Um, and Rudine Sims, Sims Bishop is one Black woman that I can uh, attribute my own growth to. Um, Melanie, that is awesome. What what a joy to have had her in your um, teaching career. Um, but Rudine Sims Bishop, Goldie Muhammad, um, my own mother, my own grandmother, all of these women, Black educators, changed the course of my own teaching career. And without them um, and their work, I would not be the person I am today. So not only do I use Rudine Sims Bishop in this presentation as a marker and an understanding of where we're coming from when we use some of these phrases, but also a reminder that um, the work of Black women, specifically Black women, has impacted all of our lives um, as educators and will continue to do so. And I think that um, as we grow in this work and we're learning more about how we can be more inclusive, we should always touch base with the um, originators, the people who deserve some, a lot of the credit um, for our growth. Back to Redeem Sims Bishop. This is a beautiful graphic by Grant Snyder. Um, and he, of course, did the first row as a tribute to Redeem Sims Bishop's original idea that books are mirrors, windows, sighting glass doors. But then he expounded on that. And you can see the other ways in which books are so many things, not only for ourselves, but for our students. And that's the power of a book, that they get to be springboards into a new idea or new place or new way. Um, they're anchors, they're quiet corners, they're warm blankets flying carpets and beacons to new readers. I love that last one because I think of my students. We have this like small couch in our classroom library. And I think of how when one student's on the couch reading a book, someone else will like see that book and come sit next with it to them to engage with them um, in the story. I just love it. <sighs> I love talking about books. I could do this all day. So, um, oh, I think I skipped a slide. Oh, how do you go back? Hold on. Okay, so now we understand what books are. Um, and so let's pretend you bought all the books in the whole wide world and you're ready to start. But that doesn't do anything for you unless the students are ready to engage in the learning around the books. And so I read few years ago, Disruptive Thinking by Kylie Beers and Robert Probst. And I loved their idea. Thank you, Karen. Um, I love their ways of connecting to books. And as educators, we're completely familiar with text to self, text to something else, text to another text. Um, so then I kind of early elementary <laughs> those things for, for my students, um, because I felt like in disruptive thinking, it is very high level, maybe later elementary, middle school, and I really needed it accessible for, um, at the time I was teaching predominantly 
ENL or ELL students. And so I wanted that population to be able to have a contextual um, understanding of some of the comprehension questions I was hoping to get out of these books. Um, and so I kind of broke down what, you know, the text to X ideas meant and made it a little bit applicable to younger students, in addition to combining it with a visual and a ASL sign. Um, so that's where heart connections come from. Um, this is heart and ASL, an idea connection is this an ASL and a life connection. This was just us doing a connect to something else, which is just a chain. Um, I will tell you teaching, even if you take nothing away from this conversation and you teach your students to sign, to respond to learning, it will change the conversation of your classroom read aloud time. So I <laughs> remember reading a story and kids are just like pounding on their heart, but the convert, like their, their own way of connecting isn't allowed to come out until, until they're called on. And so they raise their hand and then you get to know exactly the kind of conversation you're about to have. So if I see a kid doing this, I know they're going to make a hard connection connecting to something that they experience. I know if they're doing this, they're like, oh, I never knew people used to live in this part of the world or speak this language or do this or that. Um, or if they're doing this, I know that they're about to say something about like, oh, that reminds me when we read this book and they talked about the de los muertos, like it helps you understand where you're going to be connecting with kids um, and it helps them be prepared and uh, speaking on their understanding. So in the book, I go in and talk a little bit more about what um, each connection means. Um, and you can feel free to like change this as it works for you. You do not have to keep it rigid. Um, and exactly aligned with how I do things, you know, I think that the great thing about education is that we're all a bunch of thieves and we steal ideas from each other and we flip it and change it and make it work for ourselves. And I, I, I love that about being a teacher that um, nothing has to be con um, one way, like we don't have to have it in one box. So um, a heart connection, again, I think is, is the one you'll see your kids doing nine out of 10 times, they're egocentric, they want to talk and talk and talk. Um, but that's perfectly normal. And that is okay. Um, but you know, you can also say like, maybe five times, maybe five times, we're going to hear a heart connection. And then three times, we're going to hear an idea connection. Um, an idea connection sounds like, whoa, I didn't know people live there. Or, whoa, does everyone eat rice like that? Or is it okay for boys to wear dresses? Or what language is that? I've never heard that before. And just building upon their lack of experience because that's what kids are coming with. They're coming with a lack of experience. It's okay for a kid to be like, wow, that is so different from something I've known. We expect kids to be unsure of the world around them, but the next step is where it matters. The next step is where we say, we do we confirm their lack of learning, learning with um, a stereotype or we, do we build upon it with like, oh, let's learn more or what question do you have about this? Or where can we go to find out new information? So those are the, these idea connections are those like special sparkle moments where we get to say like, oh, okay, well, let's look it up. I don't know, I don't know nothing about this. Uh, let's see, is it okay for boys to wear dresses? Oh yeah, yeah, it is. Cause gender expression is just one way that people show who they are. Okay, let's move on. Let's go back to the book, blah, blah, blah. Um, but sometimes I know because I've experienced it, those idea connections can feel scary if we don't feel empowered to remove our own bias, our own ignorance, our own things and, and feel like, Oh, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, well, we don't talk about that at school, right? I've said that a billion times. We don't, we don't talk about that at school. Well, where do they talk about those things? Where do they get confirmation, either positive or negative, that their ideas are okay, that their questions are okay, that what they're thinking is okay? If it doesn't happen in school, where does it happen? And 
life connection. So those are super vague. Those are kind of woo. Um, and it can be connected to anything, something you read before, something happening in the world right now. Um, and you don't have to have it be so rigid. It can definitely be a little bit open so that it gives kids a chance to be like, uh, I think one time my uncle wore a dress to a wedding. Maybe that is a connection that that one student has to something. And like, just, it can be okay for them to have open-endedness. Um, somebody says, I think it's okay for you to be honest when kids say they don't know, or you don't know. I love saying, I don't know, I'm sorry, let's figure it out. Because that's honest. And I think it's okay to write things down on a post to get back to it. It's okay to stop a story and Google information. It's okay to stop a story and come back the next day. It's like we're reading a book and it comes across a part I'm not sure about. You know what readers, we're gonna stop here. Missy, he is gonna do a little bit more detective work. And when I come back with a good answer and an answer I think we're ready to dig in with, we're gonna start the book again because it's okay not to know. So one book that I love to talk about um, is Jabari Jumps. So, oh, um, it's okay. Well, some of that slide didn't load. Jabari Jumps is a story of young Jabari going to a swimming pool to experience um, what it's like to go up a diving board and jump off. Um, he's had a summer of swimming training. He feels very prepared as he's approaching the pool with his father and sister. And I love this moment at, I love this book at the beginning of the school year because a lot of kids have come from the summer with experience in water play, um, various, various experiences with water balloons or going to the city park or jumping in a pool, like a lot of water play happens over the summer um, sometimes. And so this is a great book to just have an entry point for a lot of students. The other great entry point is that feeling of being nervous and scared and trying new things, like coming to kindergarten for the first time, like leaving and seeing your family in one area and you're someplace else. All of these feelings are normal or typical for young children. And so it's a great entry point to get kids into the habit of making heart connections, connecting to something else ideas um, or an idea connection. Um, so it says parts of this didn't load. That's cool. Um, what was supposed to be here, which I'm not sure why it's not, is... Um, pictures of my kids showing their own experience. So that'll just have to happen at another date. I'm so sorry. The good news is it is in the book. You can see it here on page eight. Um, so the other element I did was had my kids use uh, just a recording sheet with a heart, a chain, and an idea. And then they are showing their own response to a story. This was the story um, oh, by Tracy Sorrell. Um, I don't know why I'm blanking. We are grateful. And so this student had an idea that he wanted to grow strawberries like we read in the story. Um, so they're making their own connections. They're talking and we're sharing um, experiences different from outside our own community. Oh, that frazzled me. All right. so. That's an example of how you can take the work of heart connections, life uh, ideas, connections outside to life into your own classroom. This, this activity, these engagement practices make some of those, I've got to do this, I've got to have my, um, what are they called? Student will objectives up. I have to have some kind of, um, student produced work, all of those things that we have to do, but we just happen to be using an inclusive, uh, diverse text. We just happen to be using a text that shows all of these different ways of being. Maybe it's a text that features different um, religious experience, a text that features different foods, all these different things. And we're still getting out all of the ways that we have to be teachers in a classroom 
in the, you know, in the real world, still, in ha still with responsibilities and things we just have to do because we have to do them. So I want to be clear that the books are just one way to start a conversation. Um, these are entry points to thinking and talking, um, and we know the power of a great read aloud. Um, but this, these things, these books just help us engage just a little bit deeper. They go a little bit further. Um, and so if you can have the time to engage in conversations, I kind of thought of bite-sized portions for people who wanted a who needed a new way to engage in conversations that were purposeful with uh, these diverse texts. So for some of us, um, engaging in these texts feels like taking a breath of air. It's very natural. It's um, not very uh, stressful. We do it with ease. But we also need to recognize that that's not the case for everyone. We're all coming into this experience at different places, and it's okay for some of us to need small steps. And so I thought of the whole experience in steps. So starting small, those are the must-haves, kind of going back to what I just shared with you, the heart connection and so on. Those are the things that you're just going to get to because you have to. And they're great to get to and you don't have to worry about it and it's very small and so all of the texts that i share in rebellious read alouds have a start small and it's and it's something as simple like with the book all because you matter um what does it mean to matter write or draw a list of all the ways you matter very small very attainable for entry level right so then we think about taking the next step which is be consistent. And those are the parts of the lesson that invite your students to dig a little deeper about the ways that we see uh, differences and similarities highlighted within the story, within the characters. And it maybe just means you're focusing on two or three pages. Back to All Because You Matter, that looks like um, on the page where it starts with And Just Like Moons, what do you think the young girl is thinking? The words say, and the whispers and giggles begin, followed by, what kind of name is that? Why is it important to pronounce someone's name correctly? And how are our names part of our identity? And so now we're digging a little deeper. We're not just like surface level. We're not just looking at one particular thing. We're thinking of the bigger picture here. Um, and then keep constant. So this is the actionable part, because I think what happens sometimes is we read a book, great book, we had some great conversations, and then we move on. But what I wanted my own students were was the ability for them to have action, to keep going, to think about what that book made us start to have conversations about, and then apply it. And so again, back to All Because You Matter, I talk a lot about the Black Lives Matter Foundation, or the, the movement and what it means for Black people to be a focused on at the moment. What does it mean for Black Lives Matter? How can, what do we do in our own community to think about what it means that Black Lives Matter? How does that show up in our lives? Um, and how, how do we help young students become allies and co-conspirators even at five and six? Um, and so here's how the lesson is broken down. I definitely just explained a little bit with all because you matter, but now we can zoom in and see um, exactly what that looks like. You can also go onto the Corwin website and see, um, you could download this lesson for the invisible boy and get um, firsthand uh, chance to explore the lesson on your own. Um, every single lesson has a learning for justice standard, which used to be the teaching for tolerance standards now learning for justice, and you can see them highlighted on the side. So it'll show you which standards for early childhood these um, books will touch upon, which is amazing because the learning for justice standards are amazing. They are just so good. Um, and so The Invisible Boy, which if you have not read yet, please just go read. Actually like go leave the chat and then come back and go get it and then come back. Um, thank you, Tori dropped the link to the Invisible Boy lesson plan in the 
chat. So thank you, Tori. This book is fabulous. Um, but here, the four strands it touches upon identity, diversity, justice, and action. And then the next piece is the whatabouts, which we reframed as the ELA standards. It's the same idea. These focus on the common core first grade specific standards because I felt like that was a middle ground for early childhood. So you'll know right away what standards you're, you're hitting just with this lesson. Um, because you know, from Texas, I know all about having to write these standards out on a sheet of paper and stick it on the wall in case you had a walkthrough observation. Then you'll see how everything is broken into, I think we skipped a page or I might've flipped it. Um, smart, start small, be consistent and keep constant. What's missing from the slide is this piece that talks about, I'm gonna go back really fast. Um, I also do for every book, there's a book biography, which gives you just a two, three sentence uh, summary of the book. But then there's also Vera's view, which I love alliteration. And so Vera's view is just a quick synopsis of my own personal take for the book. And it's just like my takeaway, my understanding, the way I think about it. So it's definitely just my opinion. Um, and then of, at the very end of every lesson is let's make a plan of action. So thinking about what can we do right now? We just read this book. Let's do something about it. And every lesson ends the same way with these three questions. Originally, the question was only one, and it was because I read this book, I now know, I think. Um, and then after writing, Tori and the other fabulous people from Corwin, feedback was like, let's expand on that a little bit. So here's the three. Because I read this book, I now know because I read this book, I wonder, and because I read this book, I understand. And those are sentence starters for you as the educator, but also for the kids. And it gives the kids a chance to be reflective and they don't need to be responsible for answering all three, right? They don't need to come, not every book needs to have this immediately heavy, heavy takeaway for these kids to feel responsible with comprehending, you know, all three heavy answers right away. But maybe this book is, oh, because I read this book, I now know that sometimes I take up too much space during recess. Sometimes I want all my friends to play my game and I don't ask my friends to play their game. And that's simple and actionable and has kids thinking about how their behavior, how their choices affects those around them. And all with a conversation and a picture book. So that's how those lessons in the book is set up. There's 45 lessons in here, um, 45 books that I adore. Um, there's also one element in here after every section of lessons. So there's lessons about our traditions are important. Our food is important. Our features are important. Our families are important. And then we ended every section with a teacher talk. And I love this so much um, because it gave me a chance to talk with teachers from all over the world really just North America, I think, because it was really just a folks in Canada and some folks in the United States. But it gives you just a glimpse of how important these conversations are, not just with educators, but I talked with um, parents, caregivers. Um, I talked with some close friends. So at the end of every section, you get to learn a little bit more about not just why Vera thinks this is important, right? But why other people do too. And this is not just a me thing. This is an us thing and we're in this together. So this is a quick, um, just data shared about the importance of diverse diversity in children's literature. This was data from 2018, but you could see on the iconographic that a majority of books were about either white or featured white characters and also featured uh, animals. And in addition to that, we learned from a study in the UK that when children were presented with a book about morality, a book about making good choices, SEL, those kind of things, and the characters in the books were animals, students were less likely to take away the meaning, the moral of the story, than when it featured a character that was a human. So 
that study alone shows us that students want to engage in texts where they're characters that are human so that they can actually take away the learning. So now what does that look like when the characters actually look like the students in our classroom, when they look like their brothers and their sisters and their mothers and their caregivers? How does that change the impact of morality uh, for our young learners? So you can see things are getting better, but we have a long way to go. And I use these slides just to remind us that the work and the power of the dollar will always change the way the work is done. Um, so as Kristen just said, buy their books and ask for them at your library. And that's exactly it. Um, we have so much power in the books that we include in our library, the books we demand from publishing houses, the books that we start to integrate into our own classrooms can change the progression of some of these graphics and um, data. And I think, oh, and then this is another graphic that shows the incredible importance of having these conversations. This one is specifically about race, but we know that that's not just the only um, way to be diverse, but we know that in race specifically, excuse me, kids are ready to talk about these things. And specifically for kids of color, brown and black students specifically are having these conversations way earlier at home with families and caregivers than white families. And so if it's important enough for black and brown families to start having the conversation around what race is, what race means to young children, it's just as important for everyone else. Um, and this that graphic is also included in the book, just in case you need a little push with your admin about the importance of these conversations. Really quickly, um, just some tips, read and read again. It's okay to stop reading a book, come back to it later. Um, listen to your kids. What are they talking about during snack time? What are they discussing at recess? How do you integrate those books into your, um, how do you find books that highlight their conversations into your library? Um, intent versus impact, uh, cross-curricular integration. So feeling like oh, okay, well, I need some books. I definitely need to start having these conversations. Well, when can I have them? Um, these books are great for social studies times, of course, but also there's some great STEM connections in so many of these books. Um, teaching Tolerance, the new name, of course, is Teaching for Justice. We need diverse books. They have grants, they have scholarships, so much available. Um, half price books is a great place to find these books cheaper. Um, and they're also online and thrift books is a great way to find books at a great price. Donors choose. I know they're doing such a big push to have um, opportunities that service diverse projects. It's a great way to find some books and um, First Book Marketplace does a lot of work for Title I schools. Um, so now I'm quickly trying to make sure I get to some of your questions. I thought I had this slide up about parents. Um, I don't, but I would like to talk about caregivers and parents um, because I know that that's important to a lot of us as we interact with some of these conversations. Um, I have about it a bit about it in the back of the book. Um, I am so I have been so blessed in my three different. Um, schools that I've taught at to have administration that is 100% behind these types of conversations. So um, I've always felt supported by my administration. I've also been very lucky to never have any parents or caregivers um, feel like my stories were, or, or these read alouds and these stories weren't inappropriate or um, not, uh, not that I shouldn't be talking to their children about these things. Um, and I actually was inspired and pushed to have conversations around um, a family in when I was teaching in Austin who wanted me to have these conversations about their own family being not represented in the stories we were reading. And so they, I, I credit them to activating some of my ways of thinking that I'm able to share now with everyone. Um, so that is to say I come from a place of 
privilege in that it's never been a conversation for me, but I also feel like I've never, I've never let a family, uh, caregivers, families think that this would not be something I would talk about. Um, I kind of have always approached back to school night with this motto that every child in this classroom will be respected, seen, cared for, and loved. And so I stand by that. And if I don't feel like a school will support me in that, that's not the school to be at. If I feel like there are caregivers who would um, disagree with my inclusive um, way of thinking, then we need to have a conversation with admin. And again, I've been lucky to have the backing of admin that I would never feel like I wouldn't have to defend myself. Um, and so I know that that's fortunate and it comes with privilege. And all I can say is like, you gotta do what's right at the end of the day. And what's right for you and what's right for kids is to be honest. Um, so I see Ms. Dunn says, what can you do if students misinterpret and call out students for their differences? Um, a white student dressing a student with colored skin as black. What can you do? Um, I guess if that student is black, then they are black. But if they're, I mean, what I tell students a lot of times is, I am black. Um, and so they'll say, no, you're brown. And I say, yep, I am brown. But what it is called is that I am black. So if you have a student, if you have students misunderstanding, then stop the conversation um, and readdress. So like, let's do some more learning. Let's figure this out. Um, the black student was, if, I don't, I can't speak to every, um, conversation, every nuance of conversation, I think before you probably should engage in these conversations, just establishing a safe and supportive community within your classroom so that every misunderstanding can um, have a resolution in a productive way, because everyone has feelings that are valid. Um, but that also misunderstandings can happen too. And so kind of feeling out the nuances there. Um, yeah, so Mary has some great suggestions. Um, just gonna go through and maybe try to find, oh, Kimberly. So every student in my classroom is respected, seen, uh, heard, cared for, loved, I mean, you can keep the list going, but I usually like, those are the ones I keep in rotation. Every student deserves to be respected, cared for, seen, heard, and loved. Um, um, okay, so if you have questions, I'm going to try my best to go through. I saw some lovely, um, oh, people suggested Dolly Parton's Imagination Station for books. I've heard that is freaking phenomenal. More reasons to love Dolly. Um, bookoutlet.com is another space uh, for great um, access to books at a cheaper rate because books are very expensive. Um, somebody says, how do you conduct read aloud time with your students? How do you have a process that you follow? How do you handle talking during read alouds? I think I'll go backwards. So the talking during read alouds is a lot of the handled with the signaling. Um, and we kind of set up a rotation around that. So like if you maybe shared a heart connection, maybe you don't get to share your connection as something else right away and you have to wait. Um, it depends also on what's happening. So, you know, different things happen. Um, and you kind of make space for longer conversations because you know kids are going to want to talk more about it. When we had our new Supreme Court justice approved into office, we had to have a lot of background conversation on what a Supreme Court justice was. So that conversation went a little bit longer before we could engage in a, you know, in a read aloud. So it kind of depends on where your work is. Um, how much time you give to a process. But I've always just 
kind of felt like any time a kid has a question, their their understanding of the signal will help me understand what's going to come next. Does that, I hope that makes sense? Additionally, you know the kid that you do, you do not need to call on every time. Like you know there there is that kid. And they're just going to say the one thing about the thing that has nothing to do with anything. So like that balance too is like, yes, all voices matter. Everyone has a chance to like have their turn, but also maybe not seven turns from the friend who says the thing about spaghetti when you're talking about, you know, the trees. Um, So I think... I'm looking through these questions. This is so hard. You all have such wonderful things. Everyone is so helpful and kind. Vera, you- there was um, just a recent question. Yes. Um, how do you bring diversity to other teachers in a way that they will want to bring these read alouds in their own classrooms? That is a great question. I do answer a little bit about it in the book. Um, Tori had this great idea about um, inviting inviting people into your classroom, other teachers. And I feel like that's something I used to do a lot of, not me inviting, but me going into other classrooms to just like see how people do things. Um, And I feel like, of course, with the pandemic, we get away from a lot of that moving around bit. But I, I feel like that is a great way to encourage other teachers to engage in these conversations like oh you know what you should totally come to my room during read aloud time I have this fantastic book I'd love for you to hear me read it aloud or even like gifting books um sometimes you know when um scholastic does their dollar books buy two extra and give it to you know just pop it in somebody's box or um, share a link to a read aloud, like, oh, y'all, we should add, add this to our Google Classroom. This book is so good. And, you know, here are some questions I asked my kids about. Parents loved it, or caregivers loved this, or whatever. You can even, like, fib a little bit. Um, I think that, again, everyone's coming into these conversations with different at different starting points. And so it's not easy not to be judgmental, but sometimes we have to like call the judgment a little bit, or I have to, um, and be a little bit more open so that, you know, what is it? You catch more flies with honey. So then now I've got you and then now like it just spreads. So it's not always easy and it's sometimes more exhausting, but at times I think it pays off more to give give out what you want back so that way you can affect more I think I feel like um share this link with them when this is over and shared with you send it to them just be like oh my gosh I saw this fantastic webinar and then just send it their way you know so little things um and there are so many great resources out there so many Susan says, do a read aloud for the staff. Yes. I used to hate being read to as a kid. And as an adult now, I'm always like, who's going to read this book to me? Like, I love to be read to. And I think a lot of people secretly do. Um, How do you have the conversation why older people are trying to keep them from reading certain texts? Oh, that's so sad. Um, I... So I live and teach in Brooklyn. So that reality is not true for us. Um, but we do talk about the, the, the fact that not everyone agrees with everyone, right? Like that's obvious. People like different things. Um, but we do, I try when I talk about these <sighs> oppressive ideas, I talk a lot about the understanding the lack of understanding that sometimes people don't understand how important it is to see themselves in books. Or sometimes people don't understand how sad it makes kids to not have the things that they need to feel like they could be better. And sometimes there's not a lot we can do about it. But sometimes 
the little things we can do about it is just as important. And I feel like taking away the, I don't know how to word it, but like taking away the like power of these bad ideas, these oppressive ideas, and just saying like, these people are scared or these people are, don't know as much as y'all know about the world. And so there's, because of their fear, they don't want other people to be as excited about the things you're excited about. And so they're letting fear do all of these things, but we know better, right? We know that understanding each, each other makes us better people. We know that taking the time to learn about other things makes us better people. So we're gonna keep doing that. And like validating the good part, not necessarily hiding it, but like definitely validating that we're gonna still do this work regardless because it's important, kind of. But again, I, don't, I say that with a lot of privilege because the flip side of it is you have to do the work of building that community with your students before you can even have these conversations. And so, unfortunately, these things are happening, but fortunately, there is so much pushback that I hope that things are going to be able to change for everyone to be better. I feel like I hope, <laughs> um, oh my gosh, we have like two minutes, y'all, and all I want to do is talk to you. Um, I love this book. I know that that's weird to say. Maybe because I feel like I know what this is going to do for kids. And I think that that's, that makes me love this book because I know y'all are going to go out there and you're already doing it. So many of you are already doing it and you're going to have some great conversations and you're going to make so many kids so happy just to even learn like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Oh. There's so many good books in here too. Okay, I stopped the slide, but there's winners, right? I feel like there's winners. Thank you so much for this past hour, which has flown by. And just a big thank you to you, Vera, um, for this webinar and for this book. All right, thank you all so much. Mm, this was wonderful. You made my evening. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us tonight.